This program features excerpts from Edgar Lee Masters' Spoon River Anthology, as well as poems by Carl Sandburg and other American writers. Hello, I'm William Shatner. This is a Norman Rockwell original called County Agent. Rockwell is just one of many fine American artists who have found joy in painting people as they saw them. We think of Whistler's Mother, American Gothic by Grant Wood, Andrew Wyeth's lovely painting called Christina's World. American poets have also had a tradition of making people come alive. Painting with words, their descriptions of characters, real and imagined, who have fascinated them. We're going to meet some of those characters in this program as Cynthia Herman, Jill Tanner, and George Backman join me in presenting a poetic portrait gallery. Everybody loved Chick Lorimer in our town. Far off, everybody loved her. So we all love a wild girl keeping a hold on a dream she wants. Nobody knows now where Chick Lorimer went. Nobody knows why she packed her trunk, a few old things, and it's gone. Gone with her little chin thrust ahead of her and her soft hair blowing careless from under a wide hat. Dancer, singer, a laughing, passionate lover. Were there ten men or a hundred hunting chick? Were there five men or fifty with aching hearts? Everybody loved Chick Lorimer. Nobody knows where she's gone. Hmm. A farewell to love. As pictured by Carl Sandburg. But the fickleness of love is shown in Anthony Hecht's portrait of an early New England gentleman, Samuel Sewell. Samuel Sewell, in a world of wigs, flouted opinion in his personal hair. For foppery he gave not any figs, but in his right and honor took the air. Thus, in his naked style, though well attired, he went forth in the city, or paid court to Madame Winthrop, whom he much admired, most godly, but yet liberal with the port. And all the town admired for two full years his excellent address, his gifts of fruit, her gracious ways and delicate white ears, and held the course of nature absolute. But yet she bade him suffer a peruke, that one be not distinguished from the all. Delivered of herself this stern rebuke, framed in the resonant language of St. Paul. Madam, he answered her, I have a friend, furnishes me with hair out of his strength, and he requires only I attend unto his charity and to its length. And all the town was witness to his trust. On Monday, he walked out with the widow Gibbs, a pious lady of charm and notable bust, whose heart beat tolerably beneath her ribs. On Saturday, he wrote proposing marriage and closed, imploring that she be not cruel. Your favorable answer will oblige, Madam, your humble servant, Samuel Sewell. Everybody's family contains its fair share of characters, and poets love to write about them. Here is Marion Montgomery's picture of Aunt Emma and Uncle Al. My Uncle Al, on Saturday night, lay warmly in the ditch, and Sunday morning saw the lordly, tisking churchward, while Aunt Emma kept the sentimental lamp bright into breakfast. And Sunday morning, Uncle Al tied granny knots and square knots and flipped nickels up his sleeve. He told about that marvelous old unicorn, the hoop snake of the ivory horn and apple tree, while Aunt Emma piled plates, rejoicing Uncle Al, out under arbor, shooting marbles with his boys. And Uncle Al called quail up in the orchard in the afternoon and sang the moon up with his brood around him on the steps, while Aunt Emma bathed the barefoot, sleepy feet. Until a solemn Sunday, 
when the lordly tisking raised my Uncle Al up from the ditch. The two to twelve to teens scrubbed necks for Sunday school, while Aunt Sweating Emma fried chicken for my lordly tisking Uncle Al. Lost marbles, square knots only, and the aphids sucked the scupper nungs. And when Aunt Emma died with cancer of the womb, the three to teens began to scatter like flushed quail. And all my Uncle Al's sharp evening calling never brought them back to roost again. People can be known by their personalities, their habits, or their professions. Here are three portraits of people who might live in any American town. Robert Hillier's music teacher, Miss Helen Lang, Phyllis McGinley's volunteer fireman, and Richard Armour's librarian. Who now remembers Miss Helen Lang, the piano teacher who loved to bang Beethoven loud on the listening air when windows were open everywhere? In the hot suburban afternoon, both leaves and people hung in a swoon, limp from the tree or limp in the swing, except for Miss Helen Lang, poor thing. Her piano keys are the keys to hell, my mother said. She plays very well, answered Aunt Ella, to be perverse. Aunt Marion's lousy it was like a curse. My aunts are dead, and so is my mother. I suppose that I and my sisters and brother alone remember Miss Helen Lang, who loved Beethoven, played with a bang. Four strident whistles means the business section. Two longs and a short, the manor. Three, the park. He knows the signals vaguely. With direction, he can unhook a ladder in the dark, rescue canaries, save a mattress hole, or pass the cups of coffee laced with brandy. No midnight blaze but finds him ready to roll, providing he's awake and the Buick handy. Monthly, he drills. But valor has its inning that autumn night when by an annual route, helmeted, gloved, with all the torches shining, he marches proudly in his crimson suit. A boy of 40 who has skimmed the cream from childhood's first and most enduring dream. Behind the desk, behind the shelf, she seems the shyest sort of elf, or mingled in with cabinets and catalogues and books in sets and paste and shears and rubber bands, a small machine with human hands. Her tread is light as down or feather. Her shoes can hardly be of leather. She speaks a muted sort of speech. Her words, half whispered, barely reach. But out of hours, who knows? Perhaps she stamps her feet and shouts and claps her hands and goes on quite a buzz. At least one rather hopes she does. I've always been intrigued by the mannequins in department store windows. And so was Louis Simpson when he drew this poetic impression. Whenever I passed Saks Fifth Avenue, I would stop at a certain window. They didn't acknowledge my presence, they just stared. He was sitting in his favorite chair, smoking a pipe and reading a bestseller. She was standing in front of an easel. She was finding it easy to paint by filling in the numbered spaces with colors, 598. 
The artificial logs glowed in the fireplace. Soon it would be Christmas. Santa would come down the chimney, and they'd give each other presents. She would give him skis and cufflinks. He would give her a watch with its works exposed, and a fur coat, and perfume. Though I knew it was neurasthenic, I couldn't help listening to the words that they said without moving their lips. The first important poet in America was a woman in the 17th century, Anne Bradstreet. One of her poems pictures the loving relationship she had with her husband, and by way of comparison, a present-day poet, Judith Viorst, draws her picture of the same subject. If ever two were one, then surely we. If ever man were loved by wife, then thee. If ever wife was happy in a man, compare with me, ye women, if you can. I prize thy love more than whole mines of gold, or all the riches that the East doth hold. My love is such that rivers cannot quench, nor aught but love from thee give recompense. Thy love is such I can no way repay. The heavens reward thee manifold, I pray. Then while we live, in love let so persever, that when we live no more, we may live ever. It is true love, because I put on eyeliner and a concerto and make pungent observations about the great issues of the day, even when there's no one here but him. And because I do not resent watching the Green Bay Packers, even though I am philosophically opposed to football. And because when he is late for dinner, and I know he must be either having an affair or lying dead in the middle of the street, I always hope he's dead. It's true love, because if he said, quit drinking martinis, but I kept drinking them, and the next morning I couldn't get out of bed, he wouldn't tell me he told me. And because he is willing to wear unironed undershorts out of respect for the fact that I am philosophically opposed to ironing. And because if his mother was drowning and I was drowning and he had to choose one of us to save, he says he'd save me. It's true love because when he went to San Francisco on business, well, I had to stay home with the painters and the exterminator, and the baby who was getting the chicken pox, he understood why I hated him. And because when I said that playing the stock market was juvenile and irresponsible, and then the stock I wouldn't let him buy went up 26 points, I understood why he hated me. And because despite cigarette cough, tooth decay, acid indigestion, dandruff, and other features of married life that tend to dampen the fires of passion. We still feel something we can call true love. Now, come with us as we visit the most famous gallery of portraits in American poetry, Edgar Lee Masters' Spoon River Anthology. The setting is a cemetery or more than 200 characters modeled on observations of real people speak their own epitaphs from the graveyard on the hill. Where are Elmer, Herman, Bert, Tom, Charlie? The weak of will. The strong of arm, the clown, the boozer, the fighter. All. All are sleeping on the hill. 
Where are Ella, Kate, Mag, Lizzie, and Edith? The tender heart, the simple soul, the loud, the proud, the happy one. All, all are sleeping on the hill. Where are Uncle Isaac? And Aunt Emily, and old townie Kincaid, and Savine Houghton, and Major Walker, who had talked with venerable men of the Revolution. All, all are sleeping on the hill. I went to the dances at Chandlerville and played snap out at Winchester. One time we changed partners, driving home in the moonlight of middle June. And then I found Davis. We were married and lived together for 70 years, enjoying, working, raising the 12 children, eight of whom we lost ere I had reached the age of 60. I spun, I wove, I kept the house, I nursed the sick, I made the garden, and for holiday, rambled over the fields where sang the larks, and by Spoon River gathering many a shell, and many a flower, and medicinal weed, shouting to the wooded hills, singing to the green valleys, at 96, I had lived enough, that is all, and passed to a sweet repose. What is this I hear of sorrow and weariness, anger, discontent, and drooping hopes? Degenerate sons and daughters, life is too strong for you. It takes life to love life. I went up and down the street, here and there, by day and night, through all hours of the night, caring for the poor who were sick. Do you know why? My wife hated me. My son went to the dogs. And I turned to the people and poured out my love to them. Sweet it was to see the crowds about the lawns on the day of my funeral and hear them murmur their love and sorrow. But, oh, dear God, my soul trembled, scarcely able to hold to the railing of the new life when I saw M. Stanton behind the oak tree at the grave, hiding herself and her grief. I was a peasant girl from Germany, blue-eyed, rosy, happy, and strong. And the first place I worked was at Thomas Green's. On a summer's day, when she was away, he stole into the kitchen and took me right in his arms and kissed me on my throat, I turning my head. Then neither of us seemed to know what happened. And I cried for what would become of me and cried and cried as my secret began to show. One day, Mrs. Green said she understood and would make no trouble for me, and being childless would adopt it. He had given her a farm to be still. So she hid in the house and sent out rumors as if it were going to happen to her. And all went well, and the child was born. They were so kind to me. 
Later, I married Gus Wertmann, and years passed. But at political rallies, when sitters by thought I was crying at the eloquence of Hamilton Green, that was not it. No. I wanted to say, that's my son. That's my son. The earth keeps some vibration going there in your heart. And that is you. And if the people find you can fiddle, why fiddle you must. For all your life, what do you see? A harvest of clover? Or a meadow to walk through to the river? The winds in the corn? You rub your hands for beeves hereafter ready for market? Or else you hear the rustle of skirts like the girls when dancing at Little Grove? To Cooney Potter, a pillar of dust or whirling leaves meant ruinous drought. They looked to me like redhead Sammy stepping off to tour allure. How could I till my 40 acres, not to speak of getting more, with a medley of horns, bassoons, and piccolos stirred in my brain by crows and robins and the creak of a windmill? Only these. And I never started to plow in my life that someone did not stop on the road and take me away to a dance, a picnic. I ended up with 40 acres. I ended up with a broken fiddle broken laugh and a thousand memories and not a single regret. From Bindle's Opera House in the village to Broadway is a great step. But I tried to take it. My ambition fired when 16 years of age, seeing East Lynn played here in the village by Ralph Barrett, the coming romantic actor who enthralled my soul. True, I trail back home, a broken failure, when Ralph disappeared in New York, leaving me alone in the city. But life broke him also. In all this place of silence, there are no kindred spirits. Oh, how I wish Dooza could stand amid the pathos of these quiet fields and read these words. She loved me. Oh, how she loved me. I never had a chance to escape from the day she first saw me. But then, after we were married, I thought she might prove her mortality and let me out. Or she might divorce me. But few die, none resign. Then I ran away and was gone a year on a lark. But she never complained. She said all would be well, that I would return, and I did return. I told her that while taking a row in a boat, I had been captured near Van Buren Street by pirates on Lake Michigan and kept in chains, so I could not write her. She cried and kissed me and said it was cruel, outrageous, inhuman. I then concluded our marriage was a divine dispensation and could not be dissolved except by death. I was right. He ran away and was gone for a year. When he came home, he told me the silly story of being kidnapped by pirates on Lake Michigan and kept in chains so he could not write me. I pretended to believe it, though I knew very well what he was doing and that he met the milliner, Mrs. Williams, now and then when she went to the city to buy goods, as she said. But a promise is a promise. 
and marriage is marriage. And out of respect for my own character, I refused to be drawn into a divorce by the scheme of a husband who had merely grown tired of his marital vow and duty. I belong to the church and to the party of prohibition. And the villagers thought I died of eating watermelon. In truth, I had cirrhosis of the liver. For every noon, for 30 years, I slipped behind the prescription partition in trainer's drugstore and poured a generous drink from the bottle marked Spiritus Frumenti. Out of me, unworthy and unknown, the vibrations of deathless music, with malice toward none, with charity for all. Out of me, the forgiveness of millions toward millions, and the beneficent face of a nation shining with justice and truth. I am Anne Rutledge, who sleep beneath these weeds beloved in life of Abraham Lincoln, wedded to him, not through union, but through separation. Bloom forever, O Republic, from the dust of my bosom. The author of Spoon River Anthology, Edgar Lee Masters, lies sleeping on the hill in Petersburg, Illinois, next to his grandmother, whom he called Lucinda Matlock, and just four graves away from Anne Rutledge. His own epitaph is taken from a poem he wrote called, Tomorrow is My Birthday. Good friends, let's to the fields. I have a fever. After a little walk, and by your pardon, I think I'll sleep. There is no sweeter thing, nor fate more blessed than to sleep. Here, world, I pass you like an orange to a child. I can no more with you. Do what you will. 